So good afternoon to you all. And at the outset, uh, on behalf of Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium and ICTS, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, 2.0 version of Coffee with Curiosity. So this is the third in the, uh, the second version that we have had after the pandemic uh, subsided. And it's a real pleasure to have Professor Vijay Tiruvadi to give this talk on the greening of, uh, greening of Bangalore, a, a wonderful topic and uh, uh, something that would have crossed our minds as Bangaloreans at one point of time or the other. So without much uh, uh, delay, I request uh, Professor J Joseph Samuel to introduce the speaker to the audience. And uh, uh, Dr. Vijay will make the presentation about the greening of Bangalore. So it could mean two things. How the greening of Bangalore happened once upon a time, how it got its uh, uh, name as a garden city, and also in the present context, the fact that greening of Bangalore is essential. So it, it could mean both. So I, I hope you'll be uh, covering both aspects of greening of Bangalore in the past and in the present, and uh, definitely what needs to be done in the future. So we extend a very warm welcome to you, sir, to this institution, to this place, and to this program. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. So now I request uh, Professor Joseph Samuel to introduce you to the speaker. Please. Thank you, Dr. Matsuran. So. Friends, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this event. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to say a few words about this activity and the activities of the ICTS, which stands for the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, which is located in Shivkoti village near Hesargatta. It's a scenic place. And those of you who explore the environs around Bangalore might be interested to pay a visit there. The ICTS is involved in several scientific activities. It includes scientific research at the international level. It also includes the hosting of conferences and meetings that bring experts in various subjects across the sciences together at the ICTS. This activity has mainly gone online during the pandemic, but we are slowly returning to normal. Finally, there's the outreach component, which I think is a very important part of the ICTS activities. And we have outreach activities at different levels addressed to school students, bachelor students, and uh, also to the general public, as this event shows. So this event is called the Copy with Curiosity. It's intended to bring the excitement and the wonder that we all have with the natural world to a larger audience than the scientific audience, the people who are actively engaged in doing science. So today, our distinguished speaker is Vijay Thiruvadi. And uh, he is deeply knowledgeable about trees, about the botanical history of Lalbagh, about the botanical history of Lalbagh and of Bangalore, and also of the Deccan Plateau and the environs of Bangalore. He is a graduate of St. Stephen's College in Delhi. And uh, so many years ago, we had a colloquium at the Raman Institute where I was working at the time. And it was a truly amazing experience to listen to him because he brought to the audience a whole new world which was right under their noses. Just after the colloquium, there was a natu nature walk, and he showed us things about the campus that we had all seen every day, but had simply not noticed. So we look forward to hearing about the history of Bangalore and the way in which the greening that we now take for granted was, uh, came to be. And let me also add that uh, Vijay runs a nature walk in Lalbagh, and this is by appointment. You can find the details of it on the internet. Those of you who love to walk around Lalbagh might be interested in getting an informed guided tour of the, of the garden. He also has a book which is titled Lalbagh from, Tipu Sulta from Sultan's Garden to a Public Park, which details the history in some detail. A lot of research has gone into this a book about four years worth of research and I'm sure we'll hear some fraction of that today. Finally, let me just mention an incidental fact. Vijay's grandfather was the illustrious scientist, Professor K.S. Krishnan, who many of us have heard about. 
So without further ado, I will not stand between your speaker and his audience. I hand the stage over to Vijay with a small memento of this event, which will help him to remember it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And I'm humbled by the fact that a talk I gave 10 years ago, no, seven years ago, in Raman Research Institute is remembered even today. <laughs> that is the first of my talks, actually. And uh, I just, with some trepidation, gave a talk that time. I'd never talked earlier about greenery in Bangalore. But almost by default, because nobody else had done, talked about the same subject, I effectively <laughs> went through the talk, and it was appreciated. So this talk which I'm giving today is largely the same talk which you had requested, with a few changes, bringing it kind of up to date. And I, 10 years ago, uh, almost to the date, I went to West End Hotel, and right behind the bell captain's, uh, uh, bell captain's desk, there was this uh, actual image of Nandi Hills. And it, you can see Nandi Hills is absolutely bare. There, there's not a single tree on it. So I wanted to know what was the date when this etching was made. Then I saw a similar etching at the sappers and miners, who have some of the earliest etchings of 17 or 20 of them, all of uh, the surrounding countryside of Bangalore and of Bangalore. There I found out the date. It was 1800 when this etching was made. Now. Just consider, it's completely bare, it's total rock that you see there, and see Nandi Hills today. It's, it's, in 200 years, a lot of things have changed. For the better, despite all our complaints of all the depredations in terms of tree cutting and the rest of it, I'm not taking sides either way, but what I am saying is that things can change very fast, and it depends, I suppose, on the will and you know, effort put in. But th this struck me as something quite extraordinary, a totally bare, solid piece of rock, a monolith, without a single tree, in 200 years has been green so greatly. So I start with that, just to let you know that this is how it was just 200 years ago, not very far from Bangalore. The next slide will tell you how we get closer to Bangalore, and it is the same thing practically. Uh, Lord Valencia was a very, very famous uh, traveler. He wrote a number of books, and uh, every one of the things he talked about were considered totally authentic. And he traveled right through Ethiopia, in those days Ethiopia, and Abyssinia, through the, uh, the Middle East. But he wrote on uh, Oman uh, and on India and on Sri Lanka, his travels through. Now this is four years after that etching was made of uh, Nandi Hills. And Lord Valencia says, he's coming in, as the British came in, as Lord Cornwallis took the same route, from the east, coming into Bangalore from Hoskote side. And he says the same thing. At six, he writes as he comes from the east, the celebrated town of Bangalore was in view. The country was the most naked than any I had yet seen. He states the same thing. It was barren, undulating rock that he saw just two centuries ago as he comes in from Oskote into Bangalore. Bangalore was well known. And of course, there are Bangalores and Bangalores today. But the area I'm covering is all the areas we hear about and which is starting from Chikbalapur side right up to where we are now and further south. So this is how Bangalore was, and this is what struck me, and I paid some attention to how the greening was done after seeing this, that in 200 years, it had completely changed. Now I go back to the earliest extant uh, greenery which we have in Bangalore, and that goes back to the time of the Cholas, when uh, there, there was a Devarakadu, or sacred grove, actually built uh, near the Devanali uh, airport, about 11, 12 kilometers east of that, 
at a place called Nallur. And that Devarakadu is called Nallur Amarai Devarakadu, uh, Topa. And they, there are one or two extraordinary things about it. It was built, I mean, set out in uh, about a thousand years ago. Lately, because people have contested the date, uh, they've had, uh, you know, a piece of wood taken out from one of the trees, a tamarind tree, and they've analyzed it with carbon dating, actually, in the Institute of Paleobotany in Lucknow, Birbal Sani's Institute. And they found out that goes back to 450 years. Now, even 450 years is quite, quite extraordinary. We're talking about the horticultural world, where everything, as you go towards the equator, uh, you know, tends to decay much faster. And the, you know, the, that a tamarind tree, it's only really the banyan which lives much longer, but that's because it puts out new trunks from the crop root and the old original trunk can die anyway. So you have banyans which are 800,000 years old, but I do not know of any other tree species which lives that long, except the ones in Nallur. Now, Nallur is a monoculture and a very strange thing that it's a monoculture of only tamarind trees. And this is a thousand years ago, that's on record, at the time of the Cholas. And the Cholas at that time had gone right up to the river Ganges, they were out in, you know, culturally colonizing Southeast Asia. They sent out expeditions all the way to China, yet they built this topa here, just near Devanahalli. And it's a monoculture of only tamarind trees. And that's quite extraordinary in itself because the tamarind is not an Indian tree. The tamarind comes from tropical Africa. Dakar, the capital of Senegal, in Senegalese means tamarind. And that whole area from the west coast of uh, Africa right across going east to the Red Sea is the home of the tamarind. And because most of our knowledge is based on British books, the trade between East Africa and the west coast of India is hardly recorded. I mean, Br British interest in this area was only after Vasco da Gama, da Gama and his sea routes. So we don't know that the tamarind actually came in from Africa, and we don't have accurate dates for it. But it's then early Tamil literature, and even in Sanskrit literature, a reference to tamarind having been brought from outside India. Now, consider the people who had this monoculture of a Devarakadu and constituting, it has only one single tree, and that is a foreign tree, because they were not so far away in terms of time, uh, in, you know, since the tamarind came into India. And this topu was there till 10 years ago to 60 acres. Now it has come down to 45 acres. Now in that, in most Devarakadas, which were large, uh, it was never just trees. There were also small temples and all the other things associated uh, uh, with trees. And these temples, I'm, I'm going to show you some of that now. Oh, okay, I'll get to that next. Yes. Good question, I don't know. I wish I knew. I, but I'll... I'll I'll keep a track of that. If you give me a ring later, I'll try and find out how long they do. But this is, this is quite extraordinary, and I'll show you why. Uh, it's, yeah, now I overshot the thing. Now can you see, this is a, what is there in Nallur now. These are very, very old tamarind trees. And uh, I'll, and the, one of these, I, I think it was particularly, may have been this one. It's a kind of 45 acres left, and there's a mini sort of special environment there. Two, three types of different species of cobras have been found there. Five different owls. It's, uh, it's still quite well preserved, though all the villagers are coming into this place. But it goes back a thousand years. Now look at this tree. Uh, it's split in half by lightning. It's a tamarind tree. And you notice the, there's a gentleman standing there, and that's a Marshal Hebley. He was once a, uh, 
one of the trustees of Bangalore Environment Trust. Look at the branch which has gone down to the ground next to Hebley. It has put out roots into the ground and it will grow up again. And then look at the next slide. This is the same tree split in half and the tree is finding ways of surviving and uh, you know it's, it's put out sprouts from below the ground coming in from the split uh, uh, the, uh, trunk and new trunks are forming there. This is quite different from the banyan. The banyan you have aerial roots coming down which become prop roots and then they become regular roots. Here you find two things happening. One is the sprouts are coming up. What you see on the left, uh, now that is, that is, you see that? That is a new tamarind coming up. Now this is an unknown feature of tamarinds anywhere. Nobody has seen this kind of thing happening with tamarinds. And there's some mutation taking place and some new means of survival with the tamarinds being found, finding in, uh, in Amur, uh, in Nalur. Now, GKVK have done a great study on this. And in fact, they've applied to the Guinness Book of World Records to have this registered as special qualities which tamarind are developing, which has been noticed first in Bangalore. I don't know what happened, whether it's, it's been recognized so. But, but look at this. I mean, to me, it's an extraordinary thing. This is the oldest extant greenery in Bangalore, 1,000 years ago in the time of the Cholas. And the trees there are all tamarind. And they are showing some very, very special characteristics. So I'll get back to where I left off from. Now, when I saw the, you know, Nandi Hills completely bare, and then again what Lord Valencia said, uh, it struck me that it must take a special kind of effort to green this whole area, which is undulating barren rock. And these lines from Mohammed Iqbal uh, struck me as being appropriate. Now, he's cocking a snook at his maker uh, in these lines. He says, thou didst create night, but, <coughs> excuse me, thou, thou didst create the night, but I made the lamp. Thou didst create clay, but I made the cup. Thou didst create the deserts, mountain, and forests. I produce the orchards, gardens, and groves. It is I who made the glass out of stone, and it is I who turn a, turned a poison into an antidote. Now, this attitude, I think, a lot of people have had, and that is what has really led to the greening of Bangalore in the last two, two three hundred years, particularly with people like Krumbegal, who brought in uh, Tabi Buyas all the way from the Cerrado, the largest grasslands in the world, then after that, again, the jacaranda came in from South America. They all made, what we see today is 75% of the trees in Bangalore are exotics, not just merely in Lalbagh, but in Bangalore. And it has happened because of, it wasn't a natural thing. It was by design. People put their minds to it, a great effort, scarred the world, as it were, for trees, because there are other trees which have come in from Yunnan province, from mid-Pacific, all right here in Bangalore, which you can see everywhere. The Oracaria trees you see in St. Mark's Cathedral and other places, even in front of the Vidana Sauda, they come from New Caledonia, uh, which is in mid-Pacific, halfway through from Australia to Fiji Islands. Now consider what has been achieved. A sapling would have been taken after Captain Cook found it in New Caledonia, which is French territory today. It's a very small island, taken to Kew Gardens, and from Kew Gardens brought to Lalbagh and planted in 1860. And that tree is still there like a beacon out in Lalbagh. And arguably the most widely traveled tree in the world. <laughs> from mid-Pacific to, to Kew Gardens, outside London, and to Lalbagh. But, but this is the wonder of how the greening of Bangalore took place. And, and this is not just the trees in Lalbagh. I mean, the Aurakarya trees are everywhere now in South India, you know. And not merely in South India, I mean, tree after tree, I'll come to that. I'll talk about all the special trees. But this quotation from uh, Sir Mohammed Iqbal, I think is very appropriate. It had taken a great deal of effort and might have failed also at many stages. 
but they were so sure of themselves and it did all work, you know. And we've now, Arun Pai has encouraged me to sit with him and to bring out some videos on specific trees. So we brought out some videos which are now up on YouTube, uh, Bang Bangalore Walks, tree spotting episodes. We brought out eight of them, each one on one tree, tracing where it has come from, the cultural impact of those trees in India and elsewhere. Uh, and maybe you can all you know, access the YouTube and have a look at it. But Arun has felt this is all very special and we should put it into videos. And they've turned out reasonably well. We brought out one on Tabe Boyers, and within two months, we've had 10,000 hits, 10,000 viewers on it. And that is all about a single genus in Bangalore, brought in by Krumbegel from the Cerrado, the largest grasslands in the world, south of Brazil, you know. Okay, next after this. Now, the greening as it took place, uh, there were, I've just crudely split it up into two portions. One is botanical. That is, Haider had a great Haider Ali and his son Tipu Sultan. Uh, they were great plant buffs, particularly Tipu Sultan. So they collected plants, not merely from all over India, but from Mauritius, the greatest uh, botanical garden probably at that time from Pample Moose in Mauritius. They brought in, it was a French garden. Uh, We'll get to that, but the, the one part of it is botanical. That is just sheer interest in plants, in trees. Out of curiosity, they were not botanists. They were fighting men, you know, fighting the British all the time. I don't know how they did it, but they chained gears pretty fast. One day they were savagely slaughtering people. The next day, setting up beautiful Islamic gardens. I don't think we can do that kind of thing today. <laughs> but not that we're required to do it either. The next is commercial. There was a lot, large number of plants. Where, you know, which were, uh, you know, for, for commercial purposes like charcoal. Charcoal was particularly required after the railways came into Bangalore. Railways came from Chennai to Jalarpet, where Indian Institute of Astrophysics have their telescope. And then it was brought in Sir Mark Kaban's time, he, he was responsible for it, from Jalarpet right up to Bangalore East Station, Cantonment Station. That is why Cantonment Station is so well known. Much later, the Central Station was built. But when that happened, they needed charcoal. And they needed logs of wood to run the locomotives. So for that, specially trees were grown also. Then there were trees grown, of course, uh, as all over India, for medicines and for plant extracts and so on and so forth. And there's Tadguni estate, which I mentioned there. Uh, now, the Rorishes, who had no connection with botany or horticulture, Devika Rani was the queen of the Indian screen, and she went right through from silent movies to talkies. Uh, after her first husband, uh, I think he died, Iman Shiroi, she got married to a Russian savant called Rorish, and the two of them, together set up Tadguni Estate, which is just 19 kilometers from Jayanagar. And the extraordinary thing is, this estate had, again, a monoculture of a plant called Barsera. And from the Barsera, you get linoleum oil, which is exported to cosmetic and pharmaceutical companies. Now, they ran it for 30 years, 480 acres with 11-acre lake. They ran it for 30 years successfully uh, providing a livelihood to them, as it were. I mean, for 30 years, they got a lot, lot of money out of this. And neither of them had anything to do with botany or horticulture. But it is 480 acres, and it is still intact, the 480 acres. But the trees are being cut, and uh, it's a very complicated thing now. It's gone to court and various things. The Russian embassy is involved because of Rorich. They have two people on the committee which oversees uh, the Rorish estate. But it's an extraordinary thing what is done. And it's a large area of land, 480 acres. And, and today, I don't think the horticulture department is, does anything like that, you know, uh, produce linoleum oil from Bersera. And these Bersera plants were imported from Mexico. There was a small 20-acre, uh, you know, plantation of Bersera right there. 
but they expanded to 480 acres and they brought in Bercera plants all the way from Mexico. So that, uh, that is what I consider it was commercial, so we leave it at that. Then of course cultural Devarakadus and Gundutopas is a cultural feature in Karnataka and of course in some other states. Now a word about Gundutopas. This is a specially uh, institution in Karnataka. 30 or 40 villages got together and they marked out an area of 30 or 40 or 20 acres, whatever it is, and they grew all the plants that they wanted, uh, which would give them, say, jasmines, custard apple, jackfruit, and they looked after this area, and every year as the crops came, they distributed it among these villages who had participated. And a large area of greenery in, a thriving greenery in Karnataka was thanks to Gundutopis. There were a lot around Bangalore and in Bangalore, which have disappeared. I'm going to show you one of them later, which is in, uh, again, quite close to Nalur. And uh, today it doesn't exist. All in 10 years, it's gone. 15 acres of a beautiful Gundutopa. And in this Gundutopa, they, they grew a lot of plants, and in time, they had festivals also, so on and so forth. But it's an integral part of the countryside of Karnataka, you know, and based on plants. And then you have, yes, then we have this, uh, you, you have uh, this particular thing called uh, kates, where a people tree is married to a name tree. The male element is the name tree, and the female element is the people tree. And some of the finest people trees, or ficus religiosa, or aralamara, uh, are found in these cutters, which you find all over Bangalore also, and out in the countryside, and it extends to Tamil Nadu and even to Kerala. And uh, the, the institution cons consisted of barren couples. They actually had what are called naga colors or snake stones sculpted, very, very beautiful, some of them, put into a body of water, and the appropriate Sanskrit slokas were chanted for nine months. Then the stones were removed and put in these kates under people and neem tree which were married, and they expected they'd have children after that. But this is a particular a special uh, institute in Karnataka, and the finest uh, people trees are definitely there. Not the neem trees, I don't know why, but I've seen a lot of magnificent people trees going up to 90 feet a night, you know, dominating the countryside. And of course, the beautiful sculptures below, the Naga colors. Uh, so I've got some three, four uh, snaps of that later. So the, I mean, this is what I call the cultural greening as it took place. Then I'll talk a little more about the uh, tigers of Mysore. Right. Now, the, you know, Haider Ali brought, Haider Ali was given the whole area as a jagir from the fort, the Pete, including Lalbagh, and further south, he was given the whole area as a jagir because he threw out the Marathas from Mysore state. And the Marathas have been raiding the state. In, in fact, they destroyed Sri, the Sringeri temple also. And uh, so the Wadayars, out of gratitude, uh, he was, Khaidar Ali was the commander in chief of Fords Dar of the Maharaja of Mysore's army. So he had this whole area, and he set up in 1758, 59, he was given this Jagir. And after that, uh, the Maharaja and his Mysore were fighting. Mysore became further enfeebled, and Haider, one aim in life was to throw the British out of South India, which was the last stronghold of the uh, Indian ruling dynasties. And he took over the state six years after he was given this Jagir from the Wadayars. And he set up three, within a year he got hold of a territory twice the size of present day Karnataka. From Dindigal and Tamil Nadu right up to Hubli Darwad. This was the area he got under control. And as an act of gratitude and piety, he set up three gardens. Now to a Muslim, a garden is a very important place. You have to design a garden 
with a sense of sanctity. Because a garden on earth is a reflection of paradise. And Haider, with this uh, lal bag in his hands as part of his jagir, he started a garden there, which was a ro royal pleasure garden, based on the Persian uh, char bag. Uh, he struggled with the aridity of the land. There was only one small pond. And he watered that th 35 acres which he had uh, by gravity from that little pond. There was a drop from where the pond was down to MTR side, a 20-foot drop, and he watered it by, by gravity. But he got his plants from the other four famous char bags in India, Mughal Gardens. One was uh, Lahore, and the other was Multan in present-day Pakistan, which had famous gardens. And then there was one in Delhi, and one in Arcot, which was very, very famous in South India. So these, that is where Haider got his plants from. Pardon? Well, I don't know. It might have been the precursor of Roshanara Gardens, you know. I'm not sure myself, but I think Roshanara Gardens was based on the original garden there, you know. Do you know Roshanara? No. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's named after one of uh, Shah Jahan's daughters, uh, Roshanara Gardens. And the Delhi Cricket Club used to be there originally. It was a great cultural center. And, and, and they had a garden. Delhi had many gardens over time. I mean, Kutsia Bagh and various other places. But the, the, this was the most famous one. And Haider got his plants from there. And they'd got their plants from elsewhere. But I don't have a listing of those plants. But Tipu Sultan was something else. He was a great plant buff. Out of sheer curiosity and interest, he wasn't a botanist. The subject of botany itself was not on the courses in Europe at that time. You know, uh, it was just Linnaeus and his students. And he did some extraordinary things. Everything he touched in terms of botany and trees turned out not merely to be a success, but showed a great deal of foresight, intuitive foresight. He had no reason to believe many of the things that he did, but they all worked out very well. To start with, he, he'd heard of the eucalyptus tree. This is, I'm talking about 1793. And he got it from Australia. Australia itself was formed as a nation in 1788, within five years of that. And the eucalyptus tree grows only in Australia. They have over 600 species in Australia, except the rainbow eucalyptus, which you also get in the Philippines. Haider Ali wanted the eucalyptus trees. And he got them. And there was a shipwreck by a Frenchman called La Bernière who had a whole lot of eucalyptus trees coming in from Australia. Haider Ali sourced his eucalyptus trees from the shipwreck and later from Pamplemousse Gardens in Mauritius. The first eucalyptus trees in India were planted in his summer palace in Nandi Hills. Now consider what happened after that. There were 16 species of eucalyptus in Nandi Hills, which are still there. Maybe many of them were brought in later by the British. But the first eucalyptus trees were very definitely brought in by Haider Ali, that's, I mean, Tipu Sultan, and that's on record. Now, the eucalyptus tree has many, many uses. You, you, you distill eucalyptus oil and you get, you know, a number of pharmaceutical products. Apart from that, and the use of the wood for construction work, it's also used for newsprint. But for the first time in the world, in Harrier polyfibers, They've converted eucalyptus pulp to rayon grade pulp, which is used to make rayon tire, uh, tire cords for strengthening tires as they are built. You know, they have these cords in there. All that comes from eucalyptus trees. And Haider brought this in five years after the formal inauguration of Australia as a nation. I mean, Tipu Sultan brought it in. Then he decided, you know, the Chakota, what we call the Chakota today, or Shadok, uh, or pomelo. He had an intuition about this. It is, the shadok is a, actually a hybrid between two uh, citrus fruits which are found in Thailand and in China at that time. He brought it in, confidently planted it outside the little hut he was born outside Devanali Fort and grew it in the slopes of Chikbalapur. Today it has a geographical indication tag. It's the finest Pomelo in the world, 
the Chakota. So you can't call any pomelo in the world a Chakota. Only the, the pomelos grown in the slopes of Chakbalapur can be called a Chakota. Just like you can't call any brandy a cognac. It has to, the grapes have to be grown in the cognac region of France for it to be, you know, a, a, a cognac. So I mean, this is all ha ha Tipu Sultan's work. Intuitively, I mean, he did these things, and the results have come later. He got silkworms from a little island called Kishim, just outside Oman. And he got the mulberry bush from China through Bengal, put the two together, and started the biggest agro industry uh, in Karnataka. It still is, the production of silk. The all I, I, I can just go on endlessly. He brought in, he sent out a delegation. They brought in uh, to Turkey, Anatolia, as it was known in those days. And he brought in the fig, or the anjir, from Anatolia. Now, Anatolia is worldwide is acknowledged as the origin of the fig, you know. And he brought it in, and it peaked with the Ganjam fig garden in Sri Rangapatna, on the outskirts of Sri Rangapatna. Now, this is all Tipu Sultan's work. I could go on with 10, 15 other things he had done. And it's hardly acknowledged today or even known what he had done. But surely he had a lot to do with the greening of Bangalore and the greening in a, in a productive way. You know, he, he got a lot of money out of it, uh, or people later did. Like he grew up directly for money, he grew poppies on the slopes of uh, uh, Chikbalapur. And that was very, very successful because he produced opium from that and sold it. You know, and, and, and he did many, many things like that. And it's quite extraordinary what he had done. I mean, this, this all what I consider part of the greening of Bangalore. And these things were done with a great deal of enterprise. It is, you know, who would imagine you pick up a pomelo from somewhere in Thailand or China, bring it to Dodbelapur <laughs> and plant it there. But Tipu did all this and more. I can't spend too much more time on what Tipu did, but there it is. Uh, he got his plants from East Africa, Mauritius, Persia, Turkey, Canary Islands, and Cape Town. It is known that he brought in oaks and pines from Cape Town, which were planted in Lalbagh, you know. Uh, and to sum it up, I must mention this from Pamplemousse Gardens uh, and other parts of East Africa, Tipu's ambassadors in Mauritius, Hussein Ali and somebody else, I forget their names, they brought in 22 chests of seeds and some of those uh, spice plants, uh, you know, cloves and nutmegs, which you get from the Banda Islands in Indonesia originally. He brought saplings of those. The ambassadors brought them to the West Coast, to Mangalore. It's all on record. And 29 post porters carried all this over the Western Ghats. There were camel trains waiting to bring it into the three gardens set up by his father, one in Sri Rangapatna, one in Lalbagh here in Bangalore, which was then referred to as the Sultan's Garden. The original Lalbagh was in Sri Rangapatna, and at Malawali, which is halfway through from here to Talakadu. That is a very, it still is a very, very green area. And you can do, you can imagine, I mean, 20 chests of seeds. And given his touch for uh, horticulture, uh, all of them must have been very successfully planted everywhere, you know. And we know oaks and pines here came in from Cape Town itself. That is, that is on record in many, many places. Okay, next, we'll go on to, yes. Now, after 1750, this is relevant, though it happened out of London, Kew Gardens uh, and London. After 1750, there were, three great plant collecting expeditions sent out from London, one by the Horticulture Society, one by the Royal Horticulture Society, and one by 12 of Linnaeus' students who were called the Apostles. They were based in London at that time. They went everywhere in the world because they had now become great seafarers, and so they could approach any part of the world. And they collected plants from Yunnan province in China, from India, of course, and from uh, the mid-Pacific, New Caledonia, and uh, Norfolk Islands, then South Africa, 
South America, south of North America, and all these plants were funneled into Kew Gardens. And Kew Gardens at that time had become the greatest botanic garden in the world, just out, outside London. Now it's directly in London. You can take the tube and go get straight to Kew Gardens uh, out of London. Now, when this happened uh, in 1800, uh, when Tipu died fighting the British, the British returned all the territories which they had won at that time uh, from Tipu Sultan. They gave it back to the warriors, but they kept Lalbagh for themselves. And that is where they were going to do a lot of work because the engine for the growth of the British Empire was not the Industrial Revolution. It was the revenues from the produce of plants. So opium, tea, jute, you mention it. Uh, that's where the money came from, real money, tea, all, all of it. You know, the opium which they exported to China and everywhere else. And they did a lot of work in Lalbagh, experimental work, especially on coffee. Today, the Arabica and Robusta coffee we have in Chikmangalore and, uh, you know, in Kurg, they were all fine-tuned and hybrids produced right in Lalbagh and by the uh, British superintendents in Lalbagh 50 years after they took over Lalbagh. But they did a lot of work uh, with, and all the plants available in Kew Gardens were available in India after Tipu died. So that was a very important thing, these expeditions. And many of the uh, people who went out on these expeditions did it at the cost of their lives. I mean, Captain Cook, who discovered the, uh, described the oracaria trees first in New Caledonia. Later, he went to Hawaii, and he was speared to death by the local inhabitants. They didn't get away easily, but they knew the risk they were taking, and yet they went and did all this, funneled all the plants into Kew Gardens, and made it. That was the beginning of Kew Gardens. Well, let me give you the date so that you can uh, place it properly chronologically. In 1759, Hyder Ali started Lalbagh. In 1760, the Earl of Butte, Butea Monosperma is the palash tree, the, uh, named after the Earl of Butte. The Earl of Butte and Princess Augusta, in the Royal Pleasure Garden in Kew, started a botanic garden. That is Kew Botanic Gardens today. Almost the same dates, 1759, 1760. So, that, so the, all the plants in Kew Gardens available, and a lot of them were exploited for their ornamental beauty uh, you know, in, in India. But the specific trees which we remember were brought in with uh, a view to what they referred to in economic botany in those days in those days, which was to collect revenue from plants, which is the engine for the growth of the British Empire. And that's exactly how it happened, you know. Okay, where are we now? Then, of course, Linnaeus' students. Now, at the same time that this was happening, there was this Lutheran and the Hall mission in Trankaba on the east coast, Coromandel coast, uh, in present-day Tamil Nadu. And a lot of the missionaries who came in, they had a lot of time on their hands. They studied all the old palm leaf manuscripts, Tamil palm leaf manuscripts. They mastered Tamil. They wrote Tamil dictionaries and things like that, uh, Tamil to English. They also studied the herbal, herbal remedies, uh, which from the uh, you know, plants uh, in that area, and sent them to Europe for identification. Uh, because they were not trained botanists initially anyway. But ultimately, a lot of the very great botanists from Europe did land up in Trankoba. One of them was Koenig. Koenig was a direct descendant of Linnaeus. He introduced, he came from the Baltic region and is a private student of Linnaeus. He came to Trankoba and he introduced modern botany into India. And his student, Roxburgh passed it all on to Benjamin Hain, who, who was the first European superintendent in Lalbagh in 1800. And that was a direct introduction of modern botany and taxonomy, which is half of botany, straight into uh, Lalbagh itself and, in a sense, into India, because this was a botanic garden. 
they worked on it. But there were a whole lot of very great botanists in Francoba at that time, almost all of them German. And they, they, they did a tremendous amount of work. It was even Sir William Jones was a, a part of what was called the uh, Francoba Brethren. Or, you know, they, they started a society and it was devoted entirely to botany. And they produced a lot of work there. So th th that had its own effects on Lalbag and this region in terms of the greening of this area. Because they, they knew exactly what would work and what would not work in many cases. So that's uh, the introduction of, one might say, intellectual inputs into the greening of uh, Bangalore. Then, of course, uh, plants from the New World. Uh, all the plants I've been talking about, jacarandas, the tabe buyas, a whole range of them. The bougainvillea comes, again, from Rio de Janeiro, a uh, whole lot of them. Now, I'll move on to the next. Uh, how am I doing for time? Could somebody? <laughs> OK, fine. Right. Now, yes, now cultural factors. Uh, I've talked about Devrakadus and Gundatopas, just starting with one of them at Nalur. And then Gundutopas also I've talked a little bit about. Then Haider Ali created three gardens. And uh, I've talked about that too. But there were a lot of planting done on the highways. The most magnificent uh, banyan trees you'll see are on highways going out of Bangalore. Uh, I'll show you some of the photographs of the magnificent. Every 100 deer, feet from Madiwal all the way to Osur, there were magnificent banyans. They're all gone except two, of the photographs of which I'm going to show you. And they are magnificent banyans. Anyway, along the highways, you had banyans and you had tamarind trees. You also had neem trees and one or two other trees commonly known across India. And in fact, Benjamin Hain had this idea. He was the first European superintendent. He said every 10 miles, have a different tree out of these four trees. You know, the tamarind and neem and banyan and peepal tree. Uh, have one, so that'll give you also a sense of distance. They used to go on bullet carts. So, so you know, one tree for 10 miles, and then another 10 miles, another tree. And of course, uh, most of the trees planted on the highways, uh, they also had produced like the tamarind, which was of great value. And you, that's why you'll find tamarinds on the highways right across through from Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. They're still there on the highways in Tamil Nadu. Unfortunately, in Karnataka, they've all been cut practically. You know. But those are the oldest uh, tamarind trees apart from the ones in Nallur, which you, which you find in India. OK. Now, now I've already talked about uh, the Kattes and Nagakallas. Then, of course, culture, Kavan Park is also a cultural factor. The concept of a park did not exist in India till the British came in. A place where any citizen could go at any time and you know, uh, spend his leisure time there, provided he didn't interfere with other people's activities. And of course, interestingly enough, Kavan Park separated the Maharaja of Mysore's territory from British India. And uh, everything east of Kavan Park, right up to the Bay of Bengal, was Madras presidency at one time. And if you go to Queen Victoria's statue in Kavan Park, at the bottom you'll see uh, the same inscription in four languages, English, Kannada, Urdu, and Tamil. Because Tamil was a language there when Queen Victoria was there. The whole area, the cantonment area and east, was all Tamil speaking. And Urdu, because the British had taken over from Haider and Tipu, and it was Dakni and Urdu, which was the languages here. Hindi was never a language here. And that's why, I suppose, the sense of imposition uh, which you have. It never was a language in, in uh, Karnataka. And that's why all the Hindi signs at one stage were blacked out on the metro stations. But Kavan Park, I mean, the 
institution of a park where you, you, you have various other institutions, with, they're all colonial imprint. The museum is a British institution, the library is a British institution, then the public offices and the architecture is all Greco-Roman style, Roman arches, ionic columns, fluted columns. Uh, so they, this is again cultural, I would say, in the greening of Bangalore, the Kaban Park part of it, you know. Okay, next. Yes, I've, I've, I've gone through Nalur now. In that, for what it remains now, 45 acres of tamarind, there is one single tree, the grand old tree from India, the banyan. Only one single species in Nalur, and that, 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 that is the tree you see, the banyan tree there. It's a magnificent banyan tree. And it's the only one there to survive for 200 years. It'll go on for another 800 or 1,000 years. Uh, and I talked about temples in uh, Devarakadis. There's one wonderful temple. I think it's the most beautiful temple I've seen anywhere at any time. Uh, because it fits in with the greenery. It is connected with greenery. And it's, uh, it's beautifully executed. The sense of modesty with which the temple was built and every one of the panels which make up the walls, it's bar-relief sculpture on the exterior, they're made with what we call chapdi stones today. And every one has a different tree which is associated with Lord Krishna's life. Look at that. It's only about 12 feet by 8 feet. It's right in the middle of the tope, Nalur Amara tope at Nalur. Just every single panel there, the walls are made out of thin uh, chapri stones, that is granite stones, three or four inches thick only. And there's a bar-relief sculpture, each one of them a narrative out of Lord Krishna's life. And I'll show you, there are two of them I'll show you. Uh, this goes all around, there are all the walls, and it's only about 12 feet. It's beautifully executed. Uh, just look at those two. On the left, you've got Krishna with the clothes of the go. Gopi is all hidden up on the Kadamba tree. Every panel has a different tree on it also, right in the middle of a Devarakada. It's very, very beautiful. And the one on the right where, sorry, where, uh, you know, Narada, I think, has smuggled in a, a demon in the form of a cow which has got into Krishna's herd, you know. And he detects it and he flings that cow, uh, you know, out of reach. And that, that's what you see on his right hand. He's actually flinging a cow, which was sent in by Narada, a demon in the form of, you know, a cow. Which is, and, and the whole, it's really very, very beautiful to see how, how beautifully these, uh, you know, bar-relief sculptures are executed. They're all intact, but the, uh, the deity inside is, was broken when I saw it, and there wasn't enough light to take out a proper... Uh, I believe that is also gone. The deity is also missing now. I'm not sure, but that's how it is. But this is worth seeing, by the way. I mean, even if I can presume on your interests, it's just 50 kilometers from Bangalore. As you go towards the airport, as the road turns left to go onto the, uh, you know, the flyover, you go a little further, then you turn right, you get to a village, Nalur, and you get to the Stopu, very nearby. Uh, people will direct you there. It's quite well known. Okay, next is some of the de famous Devarakadis around Bangalore. They're all intact, but they've been greatly reduced in size. Now, this is a stitched up photograph, so it's got a wide angle of uh, Devarakadi at uh, Sivaganga. It's of a monoculture of the Mahua tree, or what is locally called a pea tree. And it's interesting because we always think of the Mahua tree as Central Indian. And of course, it is the core, you know, the, all the tribes across from Gujarat right up to Bengal, their life is based around the Mahua tree, the folk dances, the liquor, you know, the uh, flowers, uh, all of it, and the oil you get from the fruit. But we also had a lot of Devarakadis which were based on the Mahua and in Karnataka. There was a wonderful, 
row of mahwa trees on the median on Sarjapur Road, which overnight were cut off. They were very old. It's also got a very beautiful reddish brown wood, a very hard wood, which can be put to many purposes. And the mahwa tree is not, I mean, the, the, the fruit, the flowers rather, they fall on the ground. And if you eat those flowers, very quickly it ferments in your stomach. And so quickly and so effectively that deer, elephants, lot bears, and human beings compete to pick up those flowers and <laughs> consume them. Because it, it ferments straight away in your stomach and you get drunk. And the elephants have a very good memory of this. Every year they will raid the huts in Bengal and in Assam, which have maua liquor. And then once they get drunk, they destroy the huts. They go a little wild, I suppose, let out their tempers on whatever is around. But they have a very good memory. They come at the right time, and they know which huts will have what maua stored in, you know, in uh, uh, terracotta. Uh, this thing. Anyway, it, it, it's really funny also. But the Adivasis, the Beals, the Gorns, all of them, their cultural life is based on the maua tree their folk dances. Then there are other purposes it serves, like the oil from the maua fruit is used for illumination in their houses. But a very interesting thing, that oil is low fat. And 32% of margarine in England for about 15, 15 to 20 years constituted maua oil. You know, it, it went out from India to an ex regular export. So it goes on and on. And this one in Sivagandhi, there's a great sense of calm and peace there. It's been reduced to about 15 acres now, this particular, uh, I'll show you a more detailed one. There it is, Mawa IP trees. Uh, it, it is in Sivaganga. And you can go out even now and see it. Uh, it it's a beautiful uh, Devrakadu. And then, of course, you've got this formidable Savana Durga, the big, huge monolith at the base uh, there's a cycling track now. You can go around the base. It's about 11 kilometers. But why I'm showing you this is it's got the greatest acacia forest in India with 17 species of acacias. Uh, if you look, I've, I've got, the next slide shows you that acacia forest look down from the fort at Savana Durga. And of course, it's got some temples and it's, uh, I believe, uh, sacred to the uh, Lingayats, uh, locally, uh, Savana Durga and the temple there. Uh, sorry, yes. So that's, that green is all acacia trees and 18 species of acacias. I consider all this as part of the greening and protection uh, of the greening in and around Bangalore. Now the next one is Vijayapura, which is not very far from Nallur. Vijaypura was known as the city of tanks. They have about 505 tanks man-made, and it supplied water for three centuries to the local inhabitants. And now rubbish and uh, garbage is thrown into it. And each one of these tanks is uh, beautifully made. Uh, they've got corridors outside and cl almost cloister-like uh, on top. And uh, all of it is beautifully sculpted. It's gone. But there was a uh, Gundatopa there. I went and saw it. It is largely constituted of jamun trees. Uh, so they must, they must have found great use of jamun trees. Large jamun trees, uh, over 19 acres, now doesn't exist. And there are these beautiful little things like the next slide you'll see. Uh, that is an old name tree there. Magnificent tree, that's one, one single name tree there, which you see. Um, you, can, you can see it right across there. That's a name tree, one of the grandest I've seen. And right in front, humble, simple, uh, you know, open shrine to Akama, uh, right there. And the villagers come and pray to that, and they maintain it. It's, it's all very, very beautiful. And, and there's a genuine sense of sacredness there. You go there, you won't be, it doesn't exist now, I don't know what's happened to it, but uh, between the Tasildar and the block development officer and the MLA, they've 
distributed the land and given it away ostensibly for hospitals and schools and the rest. We don't know what's going to happen to it. But it's just wiped out, you know. But I've got it on record, some part of it. Then, of course, there's Lalbagh. 200 acres. And this is the only bit of green in Bangalore which has grown over the years. Started out as 35 acres in Kempe Gowda's time. When Kempe Gowda built a star in Lalbagh, that is 1537. By the side, he built what is called a Huvina Tofu for growing flowers for temples in his domain. It used to go out every day. And that is the same location where Lalbagh was started by Haider Ali. And through the centuries, they must have kept growing the flowers specifically for temples. I've tried to get a list of those flowers. I'm not able to get it anywhere. It would be nice to see, uh, because there's a listing of about, I mean, there was once about 40 different species grown, and all specifically for temples. And then, of course, in uh, 1760, Haider Ali took over the area. And there were four or five very famous artists who had you know, actually made drawings from Kempegaudas, what is called Kempegaudas Tower today, of uh, Lalbagh. And that is one of them. It's by James Hunter. And then Claude Martin made one, a whole lot of them. And that gives you a good idea. You can see the vertical. It was called Rose and Cypress Garden in those days. You can see the vertical lines are all, uh, those are all cypress trees, Rose and Cypress Gardens, you know. And it was a royal pleasure garden as it started out under either rally. It was not open to the public. And it's interesting, even today, one of the roads inside Lalbagh is still called Zenana Road. So there must have been some structures inside there from either Raleigh's times, you know. But word Zenana still remains there. They haven't removed it yet, and it still remains there. Anyway, so I'm going to show you some of the trees in Lalbagh, which have come from all over the world, just to show you the incredible biodiversity brought in from all over the world. And I've seen quite a few botanic gardens, and I'm sure all of you have worldwide. The special thing about Lalbagh and Bangalore is our altitude at 3,000 feet. We are able to grow trees from equatorial regions right up to 3,000 feet where we are, up to six, 8,000 feet even. And that is what you're going to see now. Trees from the Pacific at sea level to trees right up to 8,000 feet, all growing comfortably in Lalbagh without any special aids, no greenhouses, no special fertilizing or anything. They're just planted. And miraculously, if you believe in tree fairies or whatever, this is the place to <laughs> look for them. <laughs> you know? uh, yes. Edward Lear was a very, very famous artist. Uh, he came to India, first went straight up to Darjeeling from Calcutta, and he produced a portfolio of 500 what he called mountainscapes. And he was one of the most widely traveled people in the world, and famous for his limericks and nonsense words, like uh, Lewis Carroll. He came to Lalbagh in 1874, and these are his lines. When he came in, he says, in 1874, Edward Lear described how he went in a dog cart to Lalbagh, never saw a more beautiful place. This is for a man who's widely traveled, you know, terraces and trellises and flowers exquisite. That is his description of Lalbagh then. Now, dog cart is a bit confusing. Uh, it took me a long time to find out what he is talking about because there are no dog carts here. He was referring to, I asked an English walker once in Lalbagh, Mrs. Poston, what the dog cart would refer to. So she said, oh, it's straight there from Charles Dickens. There are these dog carts. The upper, you know, the hunters sat on top and, you know, the dogs were there for hunting below, uh, two-tiered and the rest of it. But actually, ultimately, what, what it amounted to was he came in a jatka. It was a, a dark cart. It used to carry mail. Mail, actually. To, so mail was dark. So it was dark cart, and he put it down as dog cart, the closest English term to 
you know, dark DAK. So, so you can imagine what Lalbagh was like then to, you know, 1874. And coming from Edward Lear, it's something very, very special because he had seen a whole lot of gardens all over the world. And he was the greatest uh, artist till today. He's the definitive works of his, uh, you know, the Parrot, Parrot family. Uh, he, he's made a portfolio and it's considered absolutely perfect. The color, the dimensions of everything from bergeriggers to cockatoos, uh, uh, you know, parakeets, macaws, all of them are painted by Edward Lear. That is out of London when he was there. Now, what you see here is a quarry pine, pine tree, right up there. Now, these come from Australia, New Guinea, Australia and limited area, Queensland and Fraser Island, and New Zealand. New Zealand is actually considered the home of the quarry pine. And it, it, there were quarry pines towering 150 feet in height, even before the Maoris came to New Zealand. And ultimately, the, the magnificent quarry pines, they considered the total mass of a quarry pine is next only to, to the giant sequoia trees you have in California, the greatest mass. They're often 150 feet in height and 15 uh, you know, meters in girth. So you can imagine the volume of wood in there. But the Maoris took to the quarry uh, pines, they considered it sacred, and they gave a name of a god to each one of the uh, magnificent quarry pines there. So the most famous one was uh, Tane Mahuta, which is 14 meters in girth, and about uh, it's about 51 meters in height. And you, you, if you go to a Maori Mo who's praying there, and you refer to the tree as Agathis robusta, which is the Latin form of it, or quarry pine, and start talking about it, he'd be offended and he'd call your children homo sapiens. You must refer to the tree by the name of the given god, you know, the given name of the god, you know. So that tree, we have two magnificent quarry pines in Lalbag. The other one's lost in a whole lot of greenery. It's much higher, it's, it's about 85 feet in height. So I couldn't take out a photograph of that. But this is one of the two in Lalbagh. Come all the way from New Zealand, you know. This, and uh, there are many things you can do with the quarry pine. It's got uh, wonderful wood, resin, which is used for linoleum, for lacquer work, uh, and for varnishes. So it's going on. All trees have various applications. But then, of course, the one we, everybody in Bangalore talks about, they call it the Christmas tree. This is Oracaria kokai because Captain Cook described it first. It's also called, uh, like most other trees, it's got 10 other names. Oracaria columnaris, uh, you know. But certainly not a Christmas tree. Christmas trees in the West are spruce trees. And those are the trees, small branches of which are put in rooms at Christmas time for the gifts to be hung. But this is a magnificent tree, as I said, probably the most widely traveled tree in the world and its height would probably about be 140 feet. We know it was planted in 1860. Now you can see what Bangalore has achieved. I mean, you could get a plant out of New Caledonia all that way across, and it's thriving here in Bangalore. Even the New Caledonians would be proud of it. And there's some special things about the Oracaria trees. Uh, if you cut a notch or injure it, it'll produce resin as a protective layer through which even Moisture cannot get in, so insects can't get in. That resin, if and when it fossilizes, will become amber. And a lot of the amber in the world is produced from oracaria trees. And the three large deposits of amber, I would say, in the world are Dominican Republic, Burma, and the Baltic region. And I don't know how the, you know, all the, Oracaria trees, there are 17 species 
of them all grow in the southern hemisphere. Uh, in Chile, which has this flagship species, then you've got Australia, then you've got New Caledonia, then you've got Norfolk Islands, uh, and New Guinea. And uh, now, now they seem to be growing pretty well elsewhere too, like in Lalbagh. And you have them all over Bangalore now. Go to St. Mark's Cathedral, you'll find them growing there. Now this is the Chinese funeral cypress tree. A little story to it, I'll cut it short. But this tree was found by a gentleman called Mr. Fortune. He was a botanist. Botanist was sent out by the British when the British nation was addicted to tea, and tea grew only in China. So they they had burned their bridges with the Chinese, uh, fought with them. So they didn't know what to do. So they decided they sent out a botanist to China, who knew Mandarin perfectly. They outfitted him in a Chinese nobleman's silk robes, and uh, they tied a pigtail onto the nape of his neck, sent him into China. He went to 330 miles inland to a place called the Boya Hills. You have Boya tea in the market also. I tried out sometime, Red Hills. And there, when he had finished stealing some 20,000 seeds of the <laughs> you know, tea seeds and some saplings, he saw in front of him a magnificent tree, 85, 90 feet in height. And it was, uh, you know, he, his reaction on seeing the tree was, it had scale-like drooping leaves coming right to the ground. Luminescent, beautiful leaves. And he, his first reaction was to say, it presented a picture of weeping loneliness. So he called it the Chinese funeral uh, cypress tree. And it's got into botanical nomenclature. It's called Cupressus funebris. Now, he took two saplings from there to Kew Gardens. I'm talking about 1850s. They promptly died in Kew Gardens. The ones we have in Lalbag, this is one of the two in Lalbag, and there's one in Coven Park afterwards. This is a, uh, probably the first Chinese funerary cypress trees grown successfully in the world outside China, judging from the dates when it was planted in Lalbag. So you can see the extraordinary collection of trees we have from all over the world. This is uh, one of the great homes in China. It's got many places where it does well, is Yunnan province. And you can see the scale-like drooping leaves coming down. And they're luminous in color. It's a very beautiful tree. Next one is ah, Montree Cypress tree. Now, along the coast of California, in Montree Bay, these trees used to grow. There were forests of them. One of the rare trees which draws moisture needs from the air itself. And of course, all cypress trees, the wood is very valuable. And it's gone off to timber merchants. Now there are two natural small groves left in California, one in Montre and the other one in Carmel. That we and all of Steinbeck's novels have been using the Montre Bay as a background on the Montre cypress trees, except perhaps the Grapes of Wrath and one or two other trees, but all the other novels are based on this area where this tree comes from. And we've got a thriving, thriving uh, Montre cypress tree in Lalbagh. Worth going and looking at all this. This is the geography of the world. Connects up with literature. I forgot to mention the quarry pine. Shakespeare coined the phrase, uh, black as jet. In England, in Whitsby, uh, fossilized wood of the quarry pine is thrown up by the sea's wave onto the shore. And it's always black, and it's fossilized wood. And Shakespeare coined the phrase black as jet because the material was fossilized wood is called uh, jet. And it was always black. And of course, today we've shortened, to, shortened it to jet black. You know? So that, that comes from the quarry. That phrase comes from the quarry pine. So this is the Montre cypress tree. It's a very valuable tree, considering it's, uh, you know, it's in its home itself, there are very few of them now. You know. And the special quality of drawing water from the moisture in the air, you know, because it's always fog bound, that region. And then, of course, this magnificent ceiba tree, 
This actually, the authorities used to casually call it uh, Seba Pendetra uh, Malabaricum, saying it came from the forests of Malabar. Uh, but I think they've got it all wrong. I've done a bit of research work on it. It's a magnificent tree, and I think it's a cross of uh, Seba from Ecuador and from Madagascar, which was commercially exploited in, uh, uh, in Indonesia first in 500 AD. It produces tens of thousands of silk cotton pods. It's a vigorous hybrid. And this tree is not on the records in Lalbagh on the maps or in their written records even 100 years ago. It's a vigorous hybrid which grows very fast. And this was actually in an area which belonged to what is called Oblipa Nursery. At that time, it is not in Lalbagh even. And it, it is less than 100 years old. And it's very, very grand. And this, of course, is a sacred tree. Uh, we've produced a whole video on it, 15 minutes. Have a look at it if you're interested in the subject. Go straight to Bangalore Walks, uh, tree spotting videos on YouTube. You'll see it. But this tree, the buttresses alone, extend to about 65 feet from uh, from end to end, you know, from there to there. And then, of course, it's, you know, pinched in there like an hourglass. Each branch is about two and a half feet at least in diameter. And it's, the spread of the tree is about 170 70 feet. And these branches go out horizontally, and many of them are climbing upwards. Even a steel beam that length would buckle under its own weight, but not for the seba. They're very, very special. Next tree, there's a whole story to it which I can't repeat because it'll take me 15 minutes. But this is called the Ficus Krishna, and it's, it's got the leaf turns around behind and forms two little pockets. And the legend is that Lord Krishna, as a child, used to store his stolen butter in these two pockets. Now, this tree, for the first time, has been referred to in Indian botanical, I mean, books on botany, only in 1910. And so this story has been made up afterwards, you know, because it's a mutation of the banyan tree and first found in a Bengali gentleman's garden in Calcutta in 1892, I think it was. He took some of these leaves and showed it to Mr. Prain, who is the director of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Calcutta, later director of Kew Gardens. And he prayed and had a look at it. He said, I don't know this tree. Can you show me? Uh, the, uh, you've shown me the leaves, but I want to go and see the tree. The Bengali gentleman was so possessive of the tree, and he knew so there's something special about it. He refused to show it to Mr. Prain. Prain sent it all off to the world's greatest expert on banyan trees, uh, Anne Casimir de Condole in Geneva, who also said, we don't know. Uh, we've never seen this tree. We don't know these leaves. But from your dialogue with this Bengali gentleman, we'll call it Ficus Krishna. And the name is stuck. And the botanic and botanical nomenclature, it's called Ficus Bengalensis, which is the Banyan variety Krishna. And the Bengali gentleman told Mr. Prain, uh, I can tell you this, that it's not a Banyan, it, a banyan leaf, but the good Lord changed the shape of the Banyan leaves for child Krishna to store his uh, stolen butter. Now, the Bengali gentleman had one thing correct, which even Mr. Prain didn't. It is a mutation from the Banyan. And even Prain didn't guess that, nor did Anne Kasumi de Condole in Geneva. But this Bengali, so it goes to show you that legends and myths often have, you know, uh, in their core, uh, you know, some truth which has now been obscured over time. And then, of course, the most famous uh, flowering tree in all of Asia, I think, considered the most beautiful flowering tree anywhere in the world, uh, which is the Amestia nobilis. Now, Lord Amherst was the Governor General of India and Burma in the around 1810 to about 1824. Uh, he, 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 at that time, the British, around 1806, 
took over Serampore in their expansionist plans, and they didn't bother about the feeling of the people in Serampore. They just took it over. And a botanist there, actually a surgeon, uh, called uh, Wallach, Nathaniel Wallach, he was one of the people jailed by them. They didn't want trouble from any of the top people in Serampur, what the Indian police today might call preventive detention, if you please. That's what they did to Wallach. So Wallach, they found, was tending to the plants in the detention center. So they felt he was harmless, then they let him loose. And he went in the direction of Nepal and carried out two great plant collecting expeditions, one in the direction of Thailand and one in the direction of Burma and, he, in, and India. He made a collection of 9,000 plants unseen by other people from areas outside the area where they grew. And he sent them all to Sir William Hooker and Kew Gardens, who took his own time, some three months or so. And the verdict was, this is the greatest single contribution of any man to science, the Evelyn Botany. That's not the end of the story. Wallach's part was really the taxonomy and classification using modern taxonomical method, uh, techniques. But all the information on the trees, the knowledge of the trees, was given by the local people and everywhere. And I like to think that this combination of Western Frontier R&D and the you know, sort of uh, intuitive experience and knowledge of the Orientals put together leads to results like this, you know. And this is when, when Wallach was, you know, the British ultimately inducted him into the East India Company, and they sent him to Burma to look for teak wood because they, uh, they didn't have enough oak. They made all their ships. I'm talking about 1824. They made all, they wanted to make all their ships out of teak wood. I've seen the oldest ship in the British Navy at Portsmouth. It's called HMS Food Joint. It's still there in service, and it's the oldest ship in British service. It was made out of teak wood in Wadia docks in Bombay. So Wallach went out looking for teak wood in Burma. And in an abandoned monastery, he saw petals of this tree. And it was an understory tree. It was in the tropical rainforest. Each one of the trees over 120 feet in height. And he traced the tree down, and uh, he collected some saplings, took it one to Calcutta, where it was grown in the Royal Botanic Gardens, and another one was sent off to Kew Gardens. And when he saw the tree, he describes it. He says, from the last branchlet of the tree, you see that cord coming down? He says there were these cords coming down, and from them you had the buds going out like hummingbirds radially from the cord. And then when the buds became, they blossomed out, they were like orchids. It's also called orchid tree. Very, very beautiful. Each one of the buds looked like an orchid when it blossomed out. And, he'd, and it was like chandeliers were hung all over the tree. It was a wonderful sight, and he described it as the most beautiful flowering tree in the world. We have about eight of these in Bangalore. They're not the suitable place for these to grow. They're grown with great difficulty. And Dr. Venu Bapu has grown one of the best ones. And it's an Indian Institute of uh, Astrophysics in Koramangla. That's the best flowering uh, Amastria nobilis in Bangalore. There are two in uh, Lalbagh, uh, then one in Krishna Rajendra uh, Nursery, then one in, if I may presume to use his name, I haven't asked him permission, but in Prasad Bidapa's house down Avanali Road. Oh, and that's a very beautiful one from the photographs that I've seen, not actually seen it. Bombay has more of them. Trivandrum has quite a few. But Sri Lanka has right along Peridinia gardens. Along the wall, they planted these for half a mile. And the flowers come out onto the main road. It's a wonderful sight. Then the next one is a plant from uh, Venezuela, it's called Brownia rosea. These are disc-like brownias, nine inches in, uh, across the disc. And it comes, it grows straight out of the trunk of the trees. You find them at one foot above the ground and all over the tree on the branches also. I'm showing you these because it shows you 
the trees have come from all over the world, which is part of the greening of Bangalore. These were brought in for ornamental greening, if, if you might say that, and also for a botanic garden where different plants are displayed anyway. And this, to me, is the most beautiful flowering tree in the world. Saraka typingensis. There's one magnificent tree in Lalbagh. And the flowers come, they're okra-colored flowers. They grow straight out of the trunk and the branches, out of the wood of the trunk and the branches, right down to the ground itself. This is the first cousin of Sarika indica, which is the Ashoka tree, where Sri Lanka, where in Sri Lanka, Sita spent a captivity. So we'll get to that also. I have a few minutes left. Okay, fine. Uh, this is a tree from uh, Indonesia. It's called Cerbera mangas. The leaves are very similar to the plumeria. It's got, you know, one thing about this tree is it's got very fragrant flowers. And it flowers through the year. It's called Cerbera mangas because the fruit are like mangoes. Mangas is another word for mango. But it's got a downside too. Uh, every one of the parts of the plant is deadly poisonous. You eat the fruits, you're dead. Uh, also the bark and perhaps the leaves. So I suggest it's, it's, it's a good tree if you know where, where, what the <laughs> poisonous parts are. Because it flowers through the year and it's fragrant. So I suggested to the authorities in Lalbagh, they should put up a board saying it's poisonous and children should keep off the tree. After some time, please keep this to yourself. I don't want to make enemies with them. I got a strange response saying that they are not going to put up this board, which I've suggested. Reason was people might come to commit suicide in Lalbagh. <laughs> now, this is an Ashoka tree. These are very fragrant, do, beautiful flowers. Do you, do you mind the, if I interrupt? Uh, what, what kind of poison did that uh, tree? What kind of poison did the previous tree have on, on the slide? That mangas tree, what kind I of poison? I can't hear. Yeah, what kind of Stone poison? deaf in one year. No, what kind of poison no, was it? What kind of poison did they have? What kind of? Poison uh, the previous one. Was it like an I don't know what kind, but I've read over and over again that yeah. the bark yeah. and maybe the roots okay. and the fruits are certainly poisonous. See, the I'm sure the leaves are. I don't know about yeah. the flowers. See me the oleander you see on the highway. In fact, the standard practice, if you wanted to get rid of somebody in Indonesia in the old days, was you invited him for dinner. You prepared some wonderful tasting soup, inserted some of the leaves of the Serbara mangas into the soup, and obviously removed them before you served the soup, making sure, of course, yours was without the leaves, the soup you drank, and the person invited for dinner, whom you wanted to uh, terminate, to use a CIA term, uh, he died after that. It's that poisonous. The leaves are poisonous. Next tree is the Ashoka tree. Now, this is the tree under which Sita spent a captivity in Sri Lanka. It has these beautiful spherical flowers, uh, pinkish vermilion in color. It changes color over time, and it's fragrant. We have about six of them in Lalbagh, and the flowers are hidden in the foliage. So that's why all the shadows. You now you can't necessarily see the flowers outside. But this is the tree which people often think, you know, the, this narrow, thin tree, the mass tree, or, you know, polyalthea tree, is the tree which is referred to when we talk about Sita's captivity in Sri Lanka, it's not so. Anyway, there isn't any shade below that. I think even Ravana would not have been rough enough to prevent her from, you know, <laughs> getting some shade in her captivity. So this is the beautiful Ashoka flower, and it's fragrant too. This is a picture-perfect tree. It's called Colville's Glory. In fact, next month, uh, in August, it should be in full bloom in Lalbagh. There are four or five of them. There are many in Coven Park, but Coven Park, the planting has been so haphazard. These trees search for uh, you know, the sun, and they're all thin, and 
the blossoms you can't even see because there's so many trees planted together. From the bottom, you can't see the flowers. But this solo tree is from Madagascar. It's called Colville's Glory. Colville was the governor general, or rather governor of Bombay and Madagascar came under his territory. Uh, there are these beautiful racemes of flowers which grow out of the foliage and then they blossom out, the buds. So you can see the flowers very clearly. The very, very beautiful uh, sort of ochre, yellow, golden color. Yes. Yes. You, you give it a name. No, I, 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 I mean it. I mean, what is a native name which is accepted across India? I mean, like, see, people say, when they see Kurupita Gyanensis, they call it the Nagamara year. You go and say Nagamara to somebody in Calcutta, they won't understand what, what you're saying. That's why you must try and stick to the Latin names. You can give it whatever name you want. No, I, I'm not being sarcastic. What I mean is it's just the given name whoever decides to give it, and then if the population accepts it, then it becomes a common Indian name for that tree. But uh, Colwyn's well, glory, I don't think, I mean, even if an Indian name is given, it's often obscure, which other people have no idea, even in the same state, or in the same language speaking area. What I've mm -hmm. noticed is we have a lot of such trees, but there is no corresponding Kannada names to it. So I was just curious to know that... They can't be because you've got to give it a name. It's come from somewhere else in the world. Right. You know, so it depends on what you give it. Okay. So, and, and, you know, the Naga Kalav thing particularly, or Raga, uh, Naga Mara, uh, Naga Linga Mara, uh, it upsets me because it's one obscure part of the flower which, with some imagination, seems like a cobra over a, uh, you know, a You're lingam. talking about the cannonball tree. That's not tree. the way to name a uh, flowering tree, you know. But it's, it's caught on. Everybody calls it Nagava, Lingamara here locally, you know. So there are two things to it. One is to describe it properly. The other is to have acceptance. And this has got acceptance, you know, Naga Lingamara. But only among Canada speaking people. If yeah. you go elsewhere, they, they might have given it a different name. And as it is, every tree, even the Indian trees, have as many names as the Indian languages. Ashwata for the people tree, Picus religiosa in Latin, uh, Aladum, uh, Arali Mara here. You know, it just goes on and on. People tree can give, uh, you, you know, it just depends on the language in which you're speaking. And, and what I've noticed is they also have a, a common name like bottle brush tree and things like that, you know? Yeah, there, exactly. there, there are over time some common English names which you have, which are accepted. Like the Gulmohor is Delonix Regia in Latin. It's called the Gulmohor by us, okay. uh, with, with some oriental embellishment, as resplendent as a or, you know, gold coin. That's what it means, oh, okay. you know, the, uh, the flower. But the British are quite precise about it. They call it the Mayflower because it flowers in May. And the French, of course, being French, uh, in a flamboyant way, they call it the flamboyant because both the leaves and the flowers seem to float on air. You know, they are light and airy and flamboyant. So they are, de and these are common names. The actual uh, botanical name is Delenix regia. You know, and even among botanical names in Latin, you often have 10, 15 synonyms, not just one. Okay. Effectively confusing everybody, you know? Right. So it takes a more of a time, especially when I give a talk like this, what is the name I should choose? Right. You know, which people will understand because there's a target audience and they must understand what I'm talking about. Right. Next is this a wonderful story. Uh, this is a very, very old Ashwatha tree. It's called the Virudha Ashwata tree. This uh, uh, ficus religiosa, or people tree. Now, when the battle of Kurukshetra took place, Vidura was the court astronomer, uh, astrologer to the Pandavas. And Virudha was called by Lord Krishna. He said, you cannot withstand the slaughter which is going to take place. 
so please leave. They're not the place for you. So he came here near Gauri Bedanur in Chikmilapur district and he, he, he spent time and then a sadhu came one day to him, Lord Krishna and his guys, and said, plant a people tree or Ashwata tree. That is a manifestation of Lord Krishna in the physical world in which we live today, as stated by himself in the Bhagavad Gita. So he planted this tree. Uh, you know, it's called the Vidura Ashwata uh, temple. And he planted this tree there. So stories go, it's, it could be 800, 900 years old. But story goes, it was planted by Vidura when he came uh, to near Gauri Bedanur. It's not quite in Gauri Bedanur. Uh, but now, that is a people tree, and then uh, uh, there's an Ashwat Kate there, and there's a Neem tree. And all these are Nagakala's offerings in the hope of bearing a child. And uh, look at the Nagakala's, which I'm going to show you. The old part of the, how to put it, countryside around Bangalore, which also have to do with trees. And so I photographed this. There's some lovely photographs, one or two more. Just look at that collection of agriculture right at the back. You've got right up there is the people tree, you know, of Ficus religiosa. And look at the offerings of Nagakali. Each one is specially and beautifully sculpted. They're all very, very beautifully executed and, and effortlessly done. And look at the next one. Monkey having a great ghost sitting on one of them right up there. Sorry. There's the monkey. Uh, and uh, that is the little temple built, just eight feet by 10 feet, which is called the Vidura Ashwata temple. You know? So Vidura, from, who came all the way from Kurukshetra, and Ashwata is the tree he planted. Uh, and this is really, to me, it's wonderful. It's just part of the culture here. And you know, each one of these sculptures is very beautifully uh, sculpted. Okay, next is the Dodda Aladamara. Now, out of the highways, within the city, in the Devarakadas, in the Gundatopas, you have banyan trees. And in my, I've written a book on uh, heritage trees of Bangalore. The first 18 trees are all banyans, all in and around Bangalore. And this, of course, the most magnificent one. The yes, uh, not the oldest, but the largest one. Uh, the, it's, it's going to, I think, going to be about four acres in extent. It's gone beyond the boundary where they've put up a fencing. It's called Dodda Aladimara. You go down Mysore Road, and then uh, there's an offshoot on the way to Magdi, I think, about nine kilometers where you have this tree. It's a magnificent tree. It's got a large number of prop roots and even more uh, prop roots which have taken root and you have the uh, tr new trunks coming up. One of the trunks was recently, uh, you know, died and uh, it came out in the papers about two weeks ago. Uh, what happens with banyan trees is for many, many years, the trees put out horizontal branches. Then it puts down aerial roots. If it gets into the ground, it draws the aerial roots, which are very thin and narrow, uh, and uh, they draw nourishment from uh, the earth. Then they climb up again, lignify, that is, get woody tissue, and then they form a new trunk over time. So, that's, so you have proper roots, then you have proper new trunks. Many of the old banyan trees, like the one from which the Latin name comes, uh, Ficus bengalensis, in the botanic gardens in Calcutta. The original trunk is gone, but now there are hundreds of other trunks and even more prop roots coming down. And it's all of half a kilometer in diameter, one single tree, you know? So that's the... Older than the one in Calcutta. This is about, I think, about three, 400 years old, you know? Thank you. Yeah, next is... To me, one of the beautiful sights around Bangalore is a banyan tree 
with these magnificent granite rocks around, which are three billion years old, these granite rocks. Just look at that. I mean, it's, and there's a, such a pervading sense of peace when you go there, you know? Uh, that old granite, the old granite rock there, you know, outcrop of it, the magnificent banyan tree. Look at all the roots, which are once aerial roots, which have come down. Now they've grown up and they've, it'll all fuse together and you'll have a mighty big one single trunk at time. Though on the highway, which I mentioned, they were grown all along the way to Hosut from Madiwal, every 100 feet. In those days, the travel was by jet cars and bullet carts. So he stopped and gave the fodder out to, for the animals to feed themselves. And it, it's, you know, part of the countryside here and in many parts of India too. But here you have the rocks also, which are part of the creation of the earth itself, which is part of my talk in Lalbagh. They're three billion years old. And look at the next one. It's, a, it's just a... The next one is a detail of the previous one. Shows you how the aerial prop roots become, you know, aerial roots and then it'll all fuse. And of course you have the uh, magnificent granite formation sticking out. That, that is about 35 kilometers down it, uh, and it's an offshoot. It goes into the countryside, about two kilometers. Now, these are the banyan trees which were on Hosur Road uh, all the way, every 100 feet. Now, this particular one has survived the road building. Uh, I'll show you two, two of them have survived. They're on the service road, one and a half kilometers before Narayana Hudralia. Now, this has got all the characteristics of a banyan. Look at the aerial roots, searching for the earth, sorry. It's coming down all the way from there, right down 60 feet to the earth. We can see two people standing there. So it gives you a sense of how grand the tree is. And there were, every 100 feet these were grown on the highway, planted on the highway. Now every one is remote except this aerial, I mean this tree and the next one. Now when the British, this is one tree by the way on both sides of the road. When the British first came into India, they called the banyan, banyan, because they found banyas were conducting business under the tree. And that is what is happening here. I mean, on, on, under this tree, you've got various stalls, so on and so forth, and, and there's a road go, going through, bananas are being sold or whatever uh, on, the, on this thing. This tree survives, and both sides are the same tree. The tree has dropped its aerial roots and probably on the road itself, which must have been cut, and, and they built the road through it. And life goes on there. I mean, every, everything you want in a village uh, happens there. And that, that is how the tree is called Banyan. Uh, by the, just look at, look at the magnificence of the tree. And we've cut them all up. They're just these two surviving because they're on a service road. And it's not part of the major highway, but it's not, not more than 40 feet away from the highway. And these are the only two, we, uh, the friend of mine called Mahesh, and that's him, he's a big lens man, a superb photographer, uh, and a technologist. He's one of the top people in uh, Alcatel and you know, the associated companies. He did this as a hobby, and we took out hundreds of photographs of the remaining, remaining trees. I've just put two of them up there. So we're nearing the end. Just a quick summation of the greening. How do those roots yeah, yeah, tell me. collect nutrients for the plant? How? How do they collect nutrients for the plant? Because they, they, were, they were just... The trees them. go, touch the ground, and they're strong enough, I mean the roots from the, uh, from the banyan tree. And when they get into the ground, they collect nutrients from the ground. And that helps them build woody tissues as they go up grow up again. And that woody tissue, each one of the roots has woody tissue. And these roots actually fuse with one another. And you get a big, huge trunk of a banyan tree which started out just as a simple root coming down. You know? 
which is thread-like roots, actually. That's, that's how they thin they are. Thank Any you. other question? Uh, no. No? OK. Right. Now I'm just going to sum it all up. And this is, these are the extant Islamic gardens around in Karnataka even today. Lalbag, of course, is there. It was based by Hyder Ali on an Islamic charbag design. So I call it Islamic garden. Then there's Rani of Bidanur. It's also called, Bidanur is also called Nagar. Uh, Rani of Bidanur had a beautiful Islamic garden. Then there was one at Sira, which is near Tumkur, where Dilawar Singh, uh, Dilawar Singh, yes, uh, Dilawar Khan, sorry. He was the viceroy of the Mughals who controlled this region for three years. He set up a very beautiful Islamic garden. Uh, I think it's still there, but not looked after. And then Krumbaigal comes along after Visveshwarya built uh, Krishna Raja Sagar Dam. At that time, the largest uh, uh, freestanding masonry dam in the world. He designed a whole new garden there on both sides of the central stream going when the sluice gates are raised. On both sides, one, became, one side became vegetable gardens. The other side, exactly like an Islamic garden, He's made a whole Islamic garden, which now, of course, they've beautified with lights and all kinds of things. Uh, when I say Islamic garden, there are certain things. When you design an Islamic garden, you've got to keep it in mind. Because it's a reflection of paradise on earth, you have to approach the design with a sense of sanctity. One of the things is all Islamic gardens have only straight lines. Taj, Humayun's tomb, just think of any Islamic garden you've seen. All of them have only straight lines, no curved lines, nothing like the Versailles or any other garden. And the reason is they were so rigid about this that a straight line and an Islamic garden symbolically represented the rigid moral path you followed in the world. If you had curved lines, that would suggest hedonism. And it went into their garden designs everywhere. You go to Seville, you go to the Alhambra, all straight lines, you know, everywhere. And uh, Krumbaigal sat down, look at the creativity of the man. He designed a whole Islamic garden and Brindavan gardens. It's all straight lines. And he tried to keep to their tenets. You had straight lines, or, or rather you had a rectangle or a square. You broke it up into quadrants. At the intersecting lines, you had raised walkways and the water channels. And the rest of the garden was sunken by nine or 10 inches or more. And they were called parterres by the French. On the edges, you put small flowering uh, plants, a narcissus or rose or whatever, fragrant. And inside, you also had small fruiting trees, like a fig tree or a pomegranate. Nothing to take you away from the two-dimensional design and the straight lines. That's why those small fruiting trees, and fragrant. This was basically what a Charbag Persian style was, which Kumbhagal has succeeded largely in, in his design of Brindavan Gardens, which is much larger. And he did the same thing with Jubilee Park in uh, Jamshedpur. That is also designed by Kumbhagal, who was, of course, based in Bangalore. And he got some help from Nirodhi, Dr. Nir uh, Nirodhi, he and Narodi designed the whole Indian Institute of Science campus. That's another bit of green in Bangalore. Dr. Narodi. Uh, next one. These are the large green areas in Bangalore today. One is Indian Institute of Science. What's it? Two, 370 acres or whatever. Now Nias is added on, I think. That, that would also be greened in time. Then you have Palace Gardens, of course, again over 300 acres. Then West End Hotel, 20 acres. You can't see the buildings if you take out a photograph from a drone. It's completely green. And I was there when I got them the green certification from the International Hotel, whatever it is. I mean, per resident there, the uh, per capita, so to say, tree covers the largest for any hotel in the world. I mean, because they're all two-storied buildings, and only so many guests can be taken in at a time. And it's got a green 
uh, tag from the international, whatever the apex body is, out of Singapore. Then, of course, and the, uh, the greening began a century ago. From Mrs. Bronson, she set up this uh, West End. It has nine rooms originally. And then from that a century ago, they kept adding on, and now it's uh, 20 acres, fully greened. Then you have the Raj Bhavan area, which is also quite a large area. Most of the plants came from Lalbagh. But Raj Bhavan, that building was made before uh, Kaban Park. And there's a record that there were 3,000 potted plants. So there may be other plants which came in not only from Lalbagh, but maybe brought in by British soldiers in those days, which were part of the potted plants. Then, of course, you've got Kaban Park, then Lalbagh. Then there are defense properties. And because there are defense properties, people can't come in there, uh, I mean, civilians. The 8,000 acres of it in Bangalore, very well wooded and very well looked after. There's a beautiful avenue of Aurakaria trees on a road within the MEG center, the sappers and miners. It's the only one in Bangalore leading to the Gulf Coast. And they've got uh, hundreds of trees in all the units, very well greened, lots of jawans to obey the orders to water the plants every day and the rest of it. And they use it and do it, look after all these trees very, very well. I mean, the MEG center is not small. It's 800 acres in itself. Golf course, stadium, everything. And it's beautifully green. And it goes all the way right up to what you have on uh, by the side of uh, the Air Force station next to JKVK. What's it called? Yalanka, is it? Uh, that area. That's all beautifully greened. So the, the and of course, uh, the Rorishis Stadguni estate. These are the large patches of green around Bangalore. You know. Now I'm getting back. I'm winding up the talk. Uh, it's, it's been difficult putting it all together in the sense of showing some continuity of the greening over a thousand years. But this is a millennium of greening I've shown you. I haven't talked about Kempegowda's time. He, uh, there, there was always settlements around the lakes and around, you know, on either shore of Arkavati River and things. But Bangalore as such to me seemed barren, so I've concentrated on that and how the greening took place. And Kempegowda, he connected up various lakes and built some more himself and had a network whereby the overflow in monsoon time from one lake went on to another lake. And obviously there were settlements around and they would have had indigenous trees and Gundatopas. All of them would have had Gundatopas at that time. And now I'm ending with showing you what Nandi Hills is like today. Look at the green there. All that is green what is completely barren. And the next one is, of course, with the Nand, sorry, with the Nandi itself. Wherever they could have grown something, uh, it has been grown. You know, uh, there are rocky portions, a large amount of rocky portions, but the rest of it has been beautifully green. And they all happened in the last 200 years. So thank you for listening to me patiently. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the talk. So now we'll have a Q&A session. Please raise your hand, and we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, first, uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Can I not use it? Because it will be easier for him. No, no, no. no, no okay. Please use it. OK. okay. Address yeah. it to my I'll, left I'll, here. I'm I'll, stone deaf on okay. the right. So uh, what's the science behind uh, so many trees from so many countries, like two hemispheres, like coming to Bangalore and growing and then staying so many years, like Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, California, everywhere, like China? I truthfully don't know. I can only guess that our altitude is the thing which has made the difference. This was used initially as an intermediary way station, Lalbagh, for growing those plants, adapting plants, from higher latitudes. Altitude and latitude can be related. 
uh, in Lal Bagh, adapting them and then dispersing them in the, uh, in the plains in lower uh, latitudes uh, and altitudes and the other way around. It's worked perfectly. I mean, it's, uh, you have things growing on the coast of India and uh, right across, as I said, uh, mid-Pacific. You have, uh, I, I didn't show you the pine, I did show you some of the pine trees and all, they yeah. live at 8,000 feet. I didn't show you the Pinus longifolia, you know, which you have in Vijay Chowk in Delhi, stunted. You know, that's the cheer pine. Uh, there are a number of them in Lal Bagh, grow to a height of 60 feet. That grows from 3,000 feet to 8,000 feet in the, right across the Himalayas. They grow well in Lal Bagh. So there can't be anything very special about the soil in Lal Bagh because every variety and type of tree seems to grow there. Different trees need different soils, yeah. uh, basically. Not, not all of them grow on the same soil. Uh, and uh, the soil which you have in Bangalore is residual weathered soil from the rocks originally. There's a substratum of rock on which ba Bangalore is built, and the earth is only about 25 feet, after which you'll definitely hit rock, wherever, whichever part of Bangalore you go to. I mean, I, I might be off Maybe by lots of nutrients because of Pardon? that? Maybe lots of nutrients because of that. I don't know. I'm just yes, that could be. That, that could be the reason. One when reason. you say lots of nutrients, you've hit on, I think, one of the reasons why. This has always been virgin land. So the nutrients have not been removed. Uh -huh. okay. You know, there haven't been right. crops all over. And, you know, the nut that, that could be one of the that reasons. Be one reason. Yes, I mean, next, if on the same land on which Lalbag is there, you try to grow different things now, it may not be as effective. As successful as Lalbagh. But what is extraordinary is you have a tree which you get from mid-Pacific and another tree which you get from 8,000 feet height growing side by side in Lalbagh, you know? Um, hi. So I had a question. So first of all, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. But uh, you mentioned a book you had written about heritage trees in Bangalore. So I just wanted to ask, you know. Just, just give me a minute. Can you hear that and tell me? Yes, that's uh, right. Yeah. So you mentioned a book you had written about heritage trees yes. in Bangalore. Is there any other, you know, popular literature that you would recommend to the uninformed person or the layman? I think, I like to think my book is popular. Yeah, but <laughs> other than that. <laughs> I don't know. There, there are very thorough studies done as one botanist would do for another. Uh, by Father Saldana. First, he, he did a tremendous work. Uh, he talks about uh, uh, Hassan area, but many of these trees are common. It's one, bio, you know, it's not just limited. Hassan or uh, Bangalore, all these are uh, drawn on maps by man. So there'd be a lot of common trees. Father Saldana did a tremendous amount uh, of work on the trees in this region. Then there's a Muslim gentleman, Rizvi or Raza, uh, who's written a book on trees. But it's all very technical. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, you ca I don't think you can get them also. Then there's a Father Matthew, who's uh, done tremendous work in the Tamil Nadu region coming on to uh, Bangalore. Uh, they, they were all people who had time and they had focused for a lifetime uh, 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 on the kind of work they did. Today, nobody does that kind of work. But there are uh, books. In fact, I've got an obscure book which I struggle with, which is The Trees of Hill Stations in South India. And that was printed 150 years ago. You can't get it anywhere. And it's nice to see that, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, detailed effort they put into it, uh, description of the seeds, of the seeds cut up, every last detail, and why the classification may be wrong, or how it might change, because it's common to some other species. Like a lot of the cassia species now uh, are called Sena so-and-so. You know, and that, that is because now people have started studying the DNA of these plants, and it slips from one place to another. And they're a big subject in itself. Yeah, but there are books, yes. You know. uh, hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so, 
uh, when I, if I were to travel to South America or if I were to travel to, you know, uh, Australia, then there's a huge uh, embargo on uh, what kind of things I can take there. For example, I cannot take plants because they would possibly be invasive and there are many instances of invasive species, uh, you know, destroying local... Yes, yes. So do you think a lot of that would have happened in the 18th, 19th century when all these plants were being brought Two here? things happened. In fact, this was a question I was asked by... Where is our friend? Uh, no, in sure. Raman Research Institute. Ah. Uh, and he caught me unaware, so I'm prepared for that now. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me, what are the invasive species you know of, which are in Bangalore? So first thought was parthenium, you know, and, and then maybe, maybe, and then I just got stuck after some time, after two, three, mentioning the lantana and parthenium. I didn't know too many invasives, but go, going through the literature, there are hundreds of invasive species across the face of India. Parthenium, you know how it came to India? It came in through PL480 wheat shipments from Brazil. It's a Brazilian plant. And it came in in C. Subramanian's time, when Bolog had come in, and uh, j just before the Green Revolution. Against rupee payment, uh, and the rupees. But the Parthenian came in from, uh, the Americans brought in some wheat from Brazil for India at a time where we would have we were really going through difficulty. That's spread across the country today. Before, I remember about 15 years ago, flying over Bangalore, it was a cover of Parthenium. Pune also was like that. So, and then of course, Lantana has been in the news uh, in the last year or two. That also comes from South America. And it came in as a decorative ornamental plant, you know. And then the uh, blue pine in the Himalayas was introduced. Blue pine, and that's become invasive. The cryptomeria was brought in from Japan into Darjeeling, but it's not invasive. Invasive meaning it prevents other plants from, takes over the whole area, and the local indigenous varieties are unable to grow there. You know? So, does that answer your question? But it's a big subject, and I can tell you this. Quarantine began in Madras port for plants in 1840s. Before that, there was no quarantine. So whatever came, just came in. And even Madras port, it was only for plants which came in through there. If you brought in plants from Mangalore at that time, uh, till there was a quarantine uh, authority in Mangalore, you could have just brought it in. Even now, many Indians bring in plants between their clothes and in the customs, nobody bothers. You know, they just don't bother. They don't know what quarantine means and what the dangers are. Huh? So that's how it is. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Bangalore Airport. But it is not necessarily invasive species. It is just the desire for us to break rules for our own personal, uh, you know, so people just bring it in. They don't bother about quarantine. Or no, and uh, the customs authorities don't stop it either. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, so I was wondering, like, we, you took us through the journey of greening of Bangalore, like hist uh, historical perspective. So even after that, I'm sure a lot of greening ha event has happened in Bangalore recently as well, right? So my question to you is, what kind of difference do you see in the greening event that was, you know, like, say, 200 years ago, 100, 200 years ago, and current practices? Well, 75% of the species, I'm giving a very rough figure, and I'm not an authority on this, but I know that Madras, for example, has about 55% and this is carefully recorded in Madras of, of the trees in Madras city across the face of Madras are exotics which means from outside India. Bangalore has very many more and many of the common trees you see here and have been brought in in the last 200 years. The Spatodia tree, the Tabe uh, all the attractive trees, I mean Gulbahor, 
Uh, they've all come in from outside. Jacaranda, the whole, a whole lot of ornamental trees, definitely. Then there were four or five trees brought in from Australia, mm. specifically for use in Bangalore, like the Cashorina was brought from Australia. Now the Cashorina has the highest thermal value when it's burnt for any wood in the world. And they brought it in when the railway started and the railways wanted Cashorina logs to be fed in to, for the locomotives. And I've read a little piece, I've lost it, I recorded a lovely little piece from the head of the Mysore State Railways, whatever it is called, to the horticulture department, your Cashorina logs, mm -hmm. there's such a fierce flame from it and heat that, you know, steel mm -hmm. sheets in the locomotives are buckling under mm -hmm. the heat. So will you, and they mm -hmm. made these calculations out, will you please reduce the thermal, <laughs> you know, the energy generated by these logs by 14% with other logs, and then we'll be safe. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, steel sheets and the locomotive uh, won't be endangered by bringing it down, bringing down the heat. So there was the Cashirina, the silver oak, uh, and two, three other trees brought from uh, Australia specifically for there for different purposes. No. So and this has largely happened in the last 200 years. Uh, all the new things uh, which have come in, uh, uh, which you see around Bangalore, the 75 percent I talked about, because the tamarind is one of the old ones which have been there now for probably 2,000 years in India. Uh, yes. So, uh, as you mentioned, that 75 percent of them are exotics. So, why not native plants? Like, why not? Uh, use native plant for the greening of the city and also like to follow up uh, with the question that he uh, asked so what can we do um, to you know like sort of prevent this problematic species like invasive species coming through as an ornamental plant or as plantation um, you know plant and sort of enjoy like green um, safe greening or something like that right I'll take it step by step from where you started, you have this wide variety of trees. But this is a natural uh, thing which happens when you have a botanic garden in the city. Lalbagh was started, declared a botanic garden in 1858. And trees from all over the world were brought in. Uh, every kind of tree, flowering trees, ornamental trees, creepers, shrubs, you know. Uh, so it's only natural that these will spread. And then again, I mean, if you start with the premise that you want only native trees, then you don't take out anything from the botanic garden. And who decides these things? Okay. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. I mean, there are, if you go to ornithologist, he say, he'll say the hell with these foreign trees. All my trees on which birds nest are trees which have grown in alluvial soils. Uh, in India, uh, by, you know, by riversides, rich soils, and the trees are used to these, or rather birds are used to these trees, and they nest in them. They're not going, for example, you won't find nests on eucalyptus trees, except for the black kite, and that also occasionally. Birds don't go to the eucalyptus tree. They react to the oil, and they don't like to nest on them, you know. And there's no cover of leaves or anything. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. My question, actually, I have several questions, but I'll stick to one for now. Um, hopefully, if you have time afterwards, we can talk about that. But um, my question actually almost follows up from the previous two questions. And it's about whether, um, whether these imported uh, imported trees and plants have had any impact on surrounding ecosystems. Uh, we know about invasive species and all, but um, Aurocaria trees, for example, are pretty widespread across South India, like you mentioned, and they're not considered invasives, but um, have they had any other sort of impact on the ecosystems? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, all the Nilgiris, for example, is completely under eucalyptus. It has destroyed the environment. It's been brought in from Australia. And they've brought it in for different reasons. Uh, yes, there's no question that 
the problem is you need to have uh, authorities who handle all this and the interaction between the div different uh, all uh, local authorities who, who have the right to plant what they want uh, and they don't have any philosophy of planting nor do they study it enough to realize what causes what harm where. I, I used to have a farm eight kilometers from uh, eight acres about 50 kilometers from Bangalore and all the villagers would complain about eucalyptus trees but they're growing them all of them and uh, they, they used to keep complaining about the fact that it seems to take nutrients from the soil and nothing else grows there. I have an elder son in Australia when I go there in Melbourne one day I went to the botanic garden and they had a kiosk of CSIRO people there uh, of Australia it's called CSIRO in Australia so I asked them about this question so they tell me tell me old story you you've got what species of eucalyptus and they're planted where in farms or in the cities so I told them yes eucalyptus citridora and globulus and whatever names I remembered species then they asked me an interesting question and you say it's grown happily by everybody I said yes including the farmers who are complaining uh, complaining about it I said yes then they said why do they grow, in, grow them I had no answer actually initially till I discovered why they grow them they grow them because lazy man's farming they cut the trees at the bottom when they get a truckload they sell it off and the tree grows regenerates of its own accord and then they complain that nothing else grows there they don't want to grow anything else they want to grow only eucalyptus I mean there's a kind of convoluted logic by which a lot of things are done here but I, the, I mean I was stumped when I was asked this question why do you grow these trees in India even the forestry department wonderful old sal forests uh, and you know tree. indigenous tree forests have been removed and eucalyptus have been planted everywhere silver yeah. oak also I didn't get the right. Yeah. Eucalyptus trees yes. have killed the bass shola forests of Kodakanal. Kodakanal had a huge bass shola tree. But now it is dead. There is no bass shola. Well, absolutely correct. Yes. Absolutely correct. And uh, the sure. growth of eucalyptus itself is more of commercial, industrial requirement. Yes, that, that, Especially, that's exactly what I, I mentioned earlier yeah. in the talk. I mean, it's used for newsprint, it's used for news so print many purposes and now. Viscose stable fibers. Without consideration for the environment. Yes. But in places like South Africa, they sort it out in a different way. There's a whole town called Sabi, very close to Kruger, Kruger National Park. And that whole town has, they manufacture newsprint. And they have uh, tens of thousands of acres of only eucalyptus. But then that is specifically uh, done. And the whole area and the habitation lives on the eucalyptus tree through the plantation and what goes into the newsprint plant. You know, it's called SABIE. It's very close to Kruger National Park. That's quite correct, but, and there they've given some thought, and they don't want to grow anything else there. It feeds an industry, so they grow the eucalyptus there. Uh, I have a follow-up question, actually. So, yeah. yes. so we are now running short of time, and we'll uh, uh, take last few questions. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so you keep There's so much of flora in Bangalore, so will there be any fauna? Yes, of course. Like what? Like what? I'm not an expert on fauna, but when you think of fauna, if you, if you take everything, including yeah. insects, there's a terrific amount of fauna in Bangalore. And of course, the more visible ones, which are still in parts of Bangalore, are things like slender loris, yeah. you know, which, uh, which is disappearing now. What? But, but if you take the insect life, uh, 
Hmm? It's a terrific amount, and geckos of different kinds. Okay. You know, reptilian life, there, there's a great deal. So you know? there are also peacocks in Bangalore, such as from my apartment, like almost every, like once or twice in a week, I can hear the sounds. Yes. Well, there are lots of peacocks. But they, they, in a sense, have to be protected. And also once, in Kengiri, apparently, like, some of my friends, like, have seen elephants over there. Wild. Yes. Well, wild elephants were everywhere around Bangalore. What? Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Nishant, no, don't I mind. Yes. You uh, give me a ring sometime, questions? we'll get together, and I'll answer all your questions. Uh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Here, any questions you have? No? Okay, please. Uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, my, other, my other question, almost a follow-up to the last question I asked, is that you mentioned that um, Bangalore is, the territory of Bangalore was pretty virgin soil before uh, the greening of Bangalore happened, mostly in British times. So are there any unique ecological um, relationships or systems that occur only in Bangalore and in the city of Bangalore, in the sense of... Truthfully, I don't know. Okay. But I, I can't think of it as being unique, otherwise people would have talked about it by now right. and written about it. After all, there's a lot of discussion of the environment, especially the last 10, 15 years. Nobody talks about any unique soil or any unique, how to put it, interaction between water and moisture and I mean like uh, the Monterey Cypress tree draws us moisture from the air. We don't have any special features like continuous fog or things are at least I'm not aware you know so and soil I keep asking this question even to soil experts is there anything special about the soil in Pangalo because the sheer variety of trees in Lalbag uh, wouldn't have happened so easily without something special. None of them are, they all talk about red loamy soil and the rest of it, but specifically nothing special. I, 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 do, I, don't, I, I don't have an answer to it. No? Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So um, you mentioned something uh, a little strange. Uh, you mentioned that the Kew Gardens and Lalbagh were sort of uh, around the same time, uh, so they were contemporary to each other. Once again, which the Kew garden? Gardens, the Kew Gardens are yes, outside yes. London, and Lalbagh, uh, they all started out uh, formally sort of around About, the same time. Yes. So is it because of uh, specific uh, reasons, uh, maybe trade uh, grew up like? No, uh, just almost accidentally, because okay. Kew Gardens was the royal pleasure garden. Uh -huh. And just suddenly, the Earl of Butte and Princess Augusta said they're going to make it a part, part of it into a botanic garden. And at the same time, Haider Ali was given this jagir. So he had to use the land, and he started Lalbagh almost identically within a year of each other. But that entirely accidental. And there's no kind of, but later, once Tipu died through Royal Botanic Gardens in Calcutta, Lalbagh was affiliated to Kew Gardens. And whatever wa wa was wanted technically was provided by Kew Gardens. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Vijay, for the wonderful talk and for patiently uh, listening to so many questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk.